What up, world? It's your boss, Kamal Nuru. So mega millions. Wow. The blade to your fade, the ends to your bends, and the cheers to your shears. You are now watching Barber World TV, the podcast. You are now tuned in to Barber World TV. I am your host, Kamal Nuru, a.k.a. Zoe Mega Millions, now International Zoe. Oh. <laughs> I'm with my brother, Kenny Warren, K-Dub, professionally known as the Average Black Man. What's good, brother? Hey, man, it's good to be here, man. This is beautiful to see. I mean, and, and actually, it just worked out. For this to um, land on, you know, I moved here June second, two thousand four. Wow! So it's been fifteen years, Damn. and um, you know, you gave me my first job out here in New York City, and um, gave me an opportunity to showcase my skills, man. And you know, it just turned into a, a, a beautiful thing over there on the east side of Harlem. No doubt. Let's talk about where you're from. Well, uh, I'm from Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's uh, people know about it a little bit, but it's it's, it's the it's probably one of the widest cities in the country. In the country, is two percent um, black. Uh huh. And um, but then for me to come to Harlem and be able to just, you know, fall right into it is just is mm -hmm. beautiful too. But you know, I'm I when I went to college, my boys in college was from Watts, so mm -hmm. I always like been around. Like we had a hood in Portland. Right. Was that like all the the black people in Portland centralized in yeah. a certain neighborhood. Yeah, everybody okay. was in Northeast Portland mm -hmm. mostly, and then they would have some black folks out in the North. But it was mostly they gentrified that. Mm. So when I go home, I don't even, I, you know, it's a couple corner stores that's still, you know, there with the wings and all that. But you don't be seeing too many black folks. You see a lot of it. Look like Williamsburg. Wow. Yeah. So, so maybe y'all one percent now. It's, it's it's probably that because a lot of black folks moved down south to Atlanta and all that. And, you know, right, right. people try to you know get some blackness in their life, man. Because you grow up, man. But I tell you what, it make you be able to fight the power. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I really take every day that we know we can't win no race war, mm -hmm. but every little battle I'm going, I'm just going to try to become victorious. I, right. I just, it's just me. People be like, why are you worried about every little battle? Because you not. Right, right. And are most of the, the black population in, in Portland from the South? Yeah. Everybody uh, migrated up there uh, like in the 50s. And, um, Was it 40s an opportunity? And 50s. Yeah, ESCO. Is this, uh, it's a steel mill up there. Okay. So all, a lot of Warrens went up there from Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that's what happened. A lot of Warrens, they was all in this one part of town called Vanport. That's where the uh, actually where the Trailblazers play right now. Okay. So they keep moving. It's plans. It's plan thirty year plans where they move yes. black people out to different areas when they find out that it's not a good land. Like they finna start. You see what's Harlem? Yeah. They seen what happened with Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. All them people was underwater downtown. They like, oh Harlem <laughs> is the is the Holy Grail land. That's uh -huh. they were, we didn't have nothing we, happen up here. Man, I had a a, a hurricane <laughs> party that night, man. <laughs> okay, so. You're in Portland. Um, what school did you go to, and how did you get into barbering? Um, okay, so I, uh, I went to Benson High School, um, same high school as AC Green, played ball and all that, state champion basketball. But then I, I, when I graduated college, I, I went overseas, and then I went to barber school. I went to well, don't, you skipped over. Tell us about your ball career because you was a baller before barber. Yeah, so yeah. let's talk about your ball career. Well. Um, the barber and the ball career kind of was together because okay. I started cutting hair when I was a freshman in high school and okay. I was cutting everybody on the hoop team, you know, okay. and then I just expanded to more. And, and you know, like I said, in, in high school, state championship at Benson High School. Then I went to Cal State Bakersfield. Okay. And um, we went to four Final Fours and won two national titles. And uh, we was 33 and 0 my junior year. I was All American. I was the all time leading scorer when I moved to New York. Uh -huh. Somebody just got my record about six, seven years ago. You and, used to um, say Google me, fam. All the time. Because they want to talk sports. But I was I was playing a little ball with y'all when I first got here. I don't uh -huh. play nothing now, man. I kept getting hurt. I was like, man, yeah. be having to walk around the city with a cracked rib for a month. Right. Can't, I can't nah. He's definitely know. a baller though. Yeah. Man, he ain't fronting. Man, then I went overseas to Sweden. Um um averaged like twenty two and then I came back, went to barber school, mm -hmm. and then I left and got a job over in uh Columbia, South America and played a season there and then I came back, finished barber school 
and started working at Terrell Brandon's barbershop in um in Portland. He was an NBA. Uh -huh. So I was cutting all those NBA dudes. So when I came to New York and was working at um your shop, you, right. you remember it was NBA dudes coming through that knew me already. Right. That was that was like my little thing that kind of made people be like, well, who is this dude? Like, like Nate Robinson. Yep. And, and Jamal, Jamal Crawford, Crawford. Steve Smith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was good, man. It, it, it was good. But coming to New York and getting that opportunity was amazing, man. Nice. I'm telling you, because it opened up so many doors. I cut so many different people. Um, you know, uh, Amari Stoudemire, um, Mario, mm -hmm. um, Jim Jones, um, more NBA. I mean, and Dominican Sue is from Portland, and right. that was. But he came through the barbershop. But that's all part of like, look at what's happening here, man. This is this is yeah. this, it's a movement. And um, we met you through your very good friend, Miss Jackson. We're going to have him on the show, too, author, writer. Got to have teacher. him on the show. Yeah, yeah. man. He's a, Thank uh, you, Mitch. <laughs> yeah, he's an inspiration, man. He's oh. a, uh, I mean, I'm, all my friends is doing well. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, uh, Mitch got the book out, Survival Math is doing well. You know, he's doing a book tour and he's teaching and uh he even got uh, you know opportunity to you know make a move to another city with a a, a, a tenure job, which is like a job for life. As right. a, and, and and you're making upwards in six figures. It's a beautiful thing to have that kind of to from come intellect. from to come from in jail <laughs> uh -huh. for selling dope to finish the school, you know, becoming a teacher and a writer, and then yeah. now look at this. This is why his second or third book. This is like his third book, right? And um, yeah, nah, man, it's uh, it's dope because it keeps me inspired, right? You know, right. It's good to know people doing good things because it, it, you know, you want to stay on the same path too, right? Plus, you know, it can happen. It it can definitely happen, definitely. So, you cutting here in New York City? Tell me, like, what did you? What is the differences when you got here and you started cutting here? What did you learn, and and so on and so forth, and on the barber side? All right, so when I got out here. I saw that um, people could really use the blade. Mm -hmm. Like we, I wasn't really using the blade on the West Coast. Really, mm -hmm. like I was doing it, but I wasn't even doing it right. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like I seen people that was like, it, it was it was just meticulous, and it was, oh man, it was. A, and then y'all was doing those blowouts. Mm -hmm. We was doing afros, but that y'all was doing blowouts where right. it was looking like like a microphone right. i'm like man so like learning how to like you know do them blowouts and it just it just made you know everything that's sharper but then when i when i started cutting the mohawk like back in like 05 right that's kind of when my whole like clientele just kind of shifted because people was like what's that about then they started getting it and right. i was like and i was talking people into it like this is gonna be like the flat top was in the '80s. I'm telling you, it sure was. And then, I mean, it's '05 now. It's 2019, and people still got variations of it. That's so right. It's like it definitely uh, was a was a influence influence on the community. Right. You know what I mean? And one thing you bought with you was uh, your share game because I guess being in Portland, you had a lot of straight hair. Mm -hmm. You had that texture, and you was a proficient on with the with the shares and and. This, the uh, shears over fingers and stuff like that when other guys weren't. Yeah, nah, that was um because when you go to a barber school out there, they don't teach you how to cut no black hair. Right. They only teach you how to do scissor stuff and like women's styles and all that. So I was actually teaching the the black haircuts on Saturdays there. They should have gave me a, a cut in my um tuition. <laughs> they do that. They definitely use the barbers that are advanced mm -hmm. as teachers in most schools. So you hear, well, how many years are you here working, cutting hair when you decide that I'm going to move this over and start a comedy career? Man, the, the funny thing about it is, so Mitch and them be having those book readings. Mm -hmm. So I was like, me and Troy uh, Hunt, we was like, oh, we're going to start trying to do some type of event. So we're going we gonna to throw the book reading for Mitch. Mm -hmm. So we got all the, you know, drinks and found this little studio and all this stuff. And so we had a book reading. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I was just hosting this since, you know, and then Mitch always was late. So okay. I had to host for extended time. Right. Right. One of the dudes that was there was friends with one of the writers. He was a, a comedian named Mike Brown, which mm -hmm. is ironic, but there's a tall, light-skinned dude out here, Mike uh -huh. Brown, and uh, he invited me to his open mic that they do with this other lady, Monica Vita and uh, Kevin Williams. And uh, mm -hmm. 
I just went to it. I waited like a month because I was like, if I'm going to get in this comedy, it, I'm going to get into this comedy for real. Like, I'm going to put the energy that I used to put into basketball right. to win championships into this comedy. And I know I'm, I know I could, I, if I put the energy, the same energy, it's going to work. That's right. So I, start, I, got, I started going to the open mics. And then that was like in March 2012. And I went back every Thursday at six. Every Thursday at six, I would leave the shop early, go to the open mic. But I, somebody was like, "You got to go to different places." I was like, "Man, I'm loyal. I don't know what y'all talking about." <laughs> they was like, "Nah, nah, you got to go." So I went to a New York Comedy Club, and then this dude was like, uh, "I see a, I see a, 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 a glint in your eye." I said, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> he was like, and because he, he was, uh, it was Steve Aaron's this dude, uh -huh. you know, he's, he's his own self or whatever. But he right. was like, no, no, I meant like if you do this bringer show where you bring like three to five people, you get to perform. So, of course, people had been like, yo, when you going to have us come out to a show at the barbershop? Because they want to see if you're going to bomb yeah. or if you're going to. Because you funny in the barbershop, but you got to translate that to on stage. It ain't the same. Right. It is different because it's eyes on you. And then. They don't know your your personality like that. You right. gotta like quickly just have like things that you know that's funny, or, or Punch you lines. lose them. Right. If you go, if you talk for a minute, minute fifteen, minute and a half, they ain't messing with you. It don't matter what you say. If you gotta get a, some laughs, when you get up there, you between fifteen and thirty seconds, you should have some type of laugh, uh -huh. or else you might lose the crowd. And that's when you lose them. Then you start sweating. Yes. You start shrinking. And now it, it, the times that seem like five minutes is, is, is eternity. It's eternity. And a heckler might and, and, throw and something. That's the worst thing when you when you're already losing a heckler that's funnier than you. Yes, <laughs> it's tough. But nah, I had that first show. Twenty seven people came out. Mm -hmm. So they like, who is this? Who is this? Kenny Moore? Is they that from like your clientele and everything? It was from my clientele. Right. Of course, it helps me in the ball. Yeah, it, oh man, it was crazy. <laughs> but that's a lot of people. Like that really. That that was like if you can bring out that many people, you could probably have your own show. Right. So by the next year, I, I went and did Caroline's, mm -hmm. and it was another one of those bringers. I guess you had to bring like mm, maybe like five five. Oh, like Caroline's, you got to sell tickets and yeah. they got to get a two drink minimum yeah. and all that so stuff. I, yeah. So I said you had to bring out like five people. Mm -hmm. Well, forty five people came out. Wow. That's when people was like. You shouldn't be making these people. They didn't give you none of the money, did they? I was like, oh man, yeah. So I started throwing my own events. And you used to throw parties and, and events in Portland. Portland. Yeah, that's the thing. So it's just man making people, you know, believe in your 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 vision and your movement and uh -huh. just pumping that. And then, like, if you get a role going where the events is good, now you didn't create your own like little lane. Right. So that, but that's what's happening now. But then also. Is now it just didn't transcend it because it's a it was a bar show down here in the village on McDougal Street, which is the most like well known comedy strip in the world right. basically because this <laughs> right. is New York City. Yeah. I mean you got the Comedy Cellar right here. You got Greenwich Village Comedy Club. The Comedy Cellar has three places over here. They got Village Underground and they got a uh, Fat Black Pussycat. And then you got the Village Lantern around the corner. So like this little strip is like. Comedy Central, and then right in the middle of that is the Grizzly Pear. It was a bar. Right. But now it looked like how what this place looked before it looked like this. You know what right. I'm saying? I used to go down there because Mike Epps was a client, Rudy mm -hmm. Rush was a client, and when I worked in a spot called Prestige, they had the Uptown Comedy Club right down the block. So right. all those dudes used to come in the shop and test their test their uh, material mm -hmm. at the barbershop without us, without us knowing Then we kind of caught on to it. Now, in regards to a barber, the barbershop, do you test your material in the barbershop? Of course. Uh -huh. I mean, but then, so now, our shop is different because we got a bunch of, we all, you know how it is in yeah. there, we all getting at each other all day, some old men style, and like, so you got to be sharp anyway. That's right. So, it's, some, it's people in my shop that, if, if people, they would, they would make these dudes just wither some of the comics. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because... They so sharp. They quick with it and just, you know, because when they come to the shop, I, I cut probably maybe 30 comedians, 30. Uh -huh, right. When they come to the shop, the you know, fellas know them because they may have performed the shop show, whatever. Right. They don't be really winning. And it's Harlem, too. That, too. Harlem is known to being pranksters and, and jokesters, you know? <laughs> you got to hold your own, all that bullying and stuff, man, like. They need to stop that bullying thing because sometimes you got to let the bully get his too. You yeah. know what I mean? And let let's let you some 
Defend yourself. Man. You know what I'm saying? I hate all that everybody's a winner gets a trophy. No. No. If you lose, you lose. Yep. No, no. Everybody's a winner. See, that's not that that's what we had to stop at the the, the bar the downtown with right. the club now. Cause it, it, what was making it the bar show is that it, it's you got you putting your friends up every week. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? No, no. Put up killers on your show. Right. Make your show hot. Right. Make, don't try to be the best comic on your show, mm-hmm. but if you got killers on there, know that you got to step your game up. That's right. That's and they're going to help you get better. That's, man. that's it. I put iron killers on my show. Iron, right? Yep. So right now, you have your own show that you're the host. So, okay, Tell us so, about that. All right. So what, what it is is Grizzly Pear Comedy Club, right? It's run by me and this dude named Gabe Dorado. So okay. basically, we the bookers there. And what's the address? Of the that? address is 107 McDougal Street. Okay. Right? So... Basically, he's a Cuban guy. I'm a black guy. We the only people of color bookers in the city. They got women, you know. They got, you know, Jewish dudes. They got white guys. But we the only people of color. So you just, you getting a different dynamic. Like people, and then the other thing is that we are comics. So when we doing things, it's by the comics and for the comics. We not like old uh Washed up people that didn't right. ma- didn't make it, and right. now we trying to make everybody jump through hoops. No, we trying to teach them like so. I run uh, seven shows. I run a, a Wednesday at eight and at ten. I run a Friday at ten and midnight. A Saturday at eight. A Sunday at eight. Uh, and a Sunday at midnight. And a Monday at midnight. Damn, you got a pretty pretty busy schedule. Right, but I'm on stage every every for all them shows. Oh, yeah. I'm not just. Like putting the show together, I'm on stage every time, and I'm giving myself twelve to fifteen minutes, and everybody else is doing eight minutes. Right, you know, so your comfortability in front of an audience and testing your material is it's crazy. I'm, I'm on some whole other stuff. I'm not just up there trying to clown. I'm trying to take them on a little trip. Right. Every joke ain't even supposed to make them laugh. Sometimes I want them to ooh and ah, because then I'm gonna bring them back in the end. Of, you know what I mean? Like it's just you make the jokes intertwine. And then, like, you keep writing and you keep building your set and keep bang. I put a meme in there. Uh, another meme over there goes with this joke. You know, this is a callback for that. It's a science. So, you know, I just, I love to stay on stage. So, right. I, and then I do other clubs. Like, you know, I do Westside Comedy Club in Greenwich and mm-hmm. I've done the Cellar twice and I've done, I do the Lantern a few times a month and I do uh, New York on independently produced shows. And, right. uh, and so basically, I do all the places, but, our club is the hottest club right now. Mm-hmm. Like the room is, we got all new. Th- the owners bought into what we was doing. Um, we got a new uh, surround sound. We got a god mic. We got like blue lights on the stage. Mm-hmm. We got the uh, the red light to get people off, just like any other club. We got posters that look like um, they look like album covers with the comedians' social media on there. So when they killing, people can take a picture of that and follow them. Right. Then this made the owners in them go get the floors redone, go get new tables and chairs. Um, then they- um, You should get some stock in They, that they job, got man. a kitchen now. <laughs> I don't know why they still making me buy drinks. It's crazy. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. They all be telling us like, yo, you've tripled our, our, you know, our revenue and all that. And that. You like, got to threaten them. Nah, I ain't even going to do it. I'm just going to let everything happen the way it's happening because people know what the difference is. It's just love. Right. And then so what we really did is we we bought some tickets. The first thing we did, we bought some tickets. I, I, I made, I took an app from my phone, made some tickets. And we got tickets made, and mm. that made the shows have value rather than them out there saying free comedy show and all that. So you get a, a, a crowd in there, and as soon as you get a bad comic, eight people walk out because they didn't pay. Right, so yeah. it was no value for the show. Right. So the first thing we did is bought tickets. That just changed everything. Right. So now, so that first the tickets was 10 bucks because we was just starting out. Now right. the tickets is $20. Wow. You know, every night of the week. And Comics is getting paid now, and hosts is getting paid. And, you know, we got places right around the corner where I hosted, and they tried to give me $3. Well, no, they gave me $3. But wow. the other dude that whose show it was, he was like, here, here go 10 because I don't want you talking crazy. Because <laughs> I'm like, yeah, they went and put the money in the bucket and pulled out, everybody pulled out money, and they gave me 3 bucks for hosting the show. I'm wow. like, we pay people 30 bucks during the week and 50 on the weekend. Right. Comics is worth something. Like That comes from me being a comedian. Right. At least you can go get you a steak after the show or something. Right. So 
being a comedian, initially the groundwork is really tough. You're not getting paid. I mean, you make way more money in the barbershop. Way, uh -huh. way more. So your heart really has to be in it. You got to really be in it because <laughs> you run around doing spots. And at first, you're probably not getting paid for those spots. Right. You know what I mean? You're just glad to be on and to be able to put on social media that you was at New York Comedy Club and Stand Up New York. And then you went down to Carolines, but then you didn't get paid for none of that. Yeah, that's, so, that's like a video music box in the beginning. Everyone was just happy to be chosen to be in the video. Right. You know, um, Classic Concepts didn't pay nobody in the beginning. We mm -hmm. were just happy to be in the video. And then after a while, you want to start getting paid for being in the video. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Same thing, you happy to be on this platform. Yep. But after a while, you want to start getting paid. Yeah. Um, do you sit down and write your your jokes? Or you have yeah. a co-writer or you write everything yourself? I, I got, I got, I write. I got people that I work with. If they say something funny, I tell them I'm writing that down and I'm using that. And they uh -huh. be like, "Go ahead, Dub. Uh, I got a chick out in Portland. She's like, I, she not even a comedian. She just be talking shit to me on, on social media. So she be in my inbox talking about. So I ask her about certain stuff and and she'll give me some feedback and I'll be like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Okay, that's an angle. I mean, she, you know, you just get little. From, feedback from people because they sometimes they might just say one line right. that just make you like like all right made so it a hot line, like, made like it a hot song. I get I, I've been <laughs> I've been closing out um um shows where I say um um I'm giving women a warning um if you go to a third world country and they put cement uh, in your ass or your titties and you get sick. That's your ass fault. <laughs> like that kind of little like. Yeah. And yeah. somebody said that to me. They was like, "Yo, what if you said ass fault?" Right. I was like, "Oh, Thank that's you. fire right there." And that <laughs> mean, you know, what I'm saying that's like just that little wordplay. Just you know, it, it. You have an advantage. You could get a lot of stuff from the barbershop. A whole lot. I got so many stories from the shop talking about how homophobic it is and and then but then at the same time all we do is brush other niggas hair all day you know like that kind of shit ain't nothing more intimate than holding another niggas ear down and taking a razor and going around it that's 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 close you all up in dude's face yeah you know all day yeah, and, and, and so this is this so much it's got the barbershop conversations man you know you, it's crazy the stuff that pe i bought a ladder at the shop i bought a ladder right so People was like, "Why? What you gonna do with a ladder?" I'm like, "Nigga, do you got a ladder?" <laughs> and niggas like, "Nah." I'm like, "Exactly. I'm one of the only niggas in the hood with ladders. Like, that's different, you know. You can't. I got a ladder, right? And then we ended up using the ladder to put the wire for the TVs to all be synced, right? So, don't ask me about why I got a ladder, right? I'm giving back to the community. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately, where do you? What, what would you like to see happen in your career? Well, I wanna um, I wanna open a, a comedy um, um, comedy club out here. I wanna open one in Portland. Um, uh, I, 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 of course, I'm gonna bring all my different aspects together. So you know, it's, it's, it's it'll be a place where I could do everything, like a metroplex. You know what I'm saying? Where the barbershop and you know, the comedy club, bar, everything, boom. Right. Um, um, and I don't want to give too much, you know right. what I'm saying? But because it's really, it's really gonna happen. It's really like people didn't reach out to me. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm just being patient and staying ready. And, right. You know, when it's that time, I'm gonna make that move. Uh, by the time I'm 50, it, it, it all of that shit will be in motion. Right. And you were working on some sketches where you had people in your chair and you was talking comics cutting comics or something like that oh, yeah. tell us about that all right so comics cutting comics was basically like um like a visual podcast you know and when they come to the barbershop comedians we would talk about sports politics religion sex everything that you're not supposed to talk about at work but we can talk about it at the barbershop Correct. and so you know you get your so but LeBron James got this show called The Shop. So basically they kind of like got the same concept, but yeah. it just they talking more about sports stuff. We had a little more, you know, humor with it and everything. Right. But I'm gonna bring back the show, but it's gotta be more dynamic. Right. It's gotta be more like um variety show ish. Right, right. Cause um, you know, just to have something that's more uh, entertainment right. and 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 less uh talk show. 
Yeah, I, I, they, a lot of people have tried over and over again to do something in the barbershop. And what they don't realize is the barbershop is not about you. The barbershop is about everybody. Mm-hmm. And and they're, every show that they try to do some barbershop, they miss the main thing. They The barbers don't have to say. And the barber has to say in every barbershop, I don't care who's in there. That's the whole thing. I don't thing. care if Jesus Christ is in the shop. Barbers is going to joke and talk. So... They keep making these shows where it's not about the barber, but the barber shop is about the barber. All about Idiots. the barber. That's what the whole thing. Holla at me when you're ready to do it right. Yo, for real though. No, for real, man. Like, <laughs> we, I mean, we bring comments. Um, when I bring comments, cutting comments back, I just want. But it's gonna be like the barber shop talks, it's, and it's gonna be like quick, like boom, boom, boom. What we talking about? Then it's gonna cut. To what we talking about, but it's gonna be like a scene where it's just a sketch of what we was talking about. Right. You right. know what I mean? So it could be like funny, like mm-hmm. catching that you know, I, I catch your attention and you know, got you. This is, you know, you gotta people's got short attention span, so you gotta kind of bounce around anyway more, right. like to right. keep them like right. you know, people people did, did man, this social media and this damn phone, man, it didn't yeah. killed us, man. We forgot. <laughs> I was just talking to this girl about how we don't even we scared of that, I'm going to go over to this girl and just ask her, can I buy her a drink? Like, we don't do that no more. We'd rather swipe and we then and match with somebody. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, like, because it, cause it wasn't, it wasn't no, no room for rejection. It's like, right. but that rejection make you stronger. That's right. We don't realize that. Like, That's we right. lost a lot, man. This next generation, I feel bad for them. For sure, for sure. Now, since you're in these two worlds, we're going to wrap it up. Give some advice to... Starting barbers and give some advice to starting comedians. Um, if you're starting as a barber, you wanna don't don't think of it as a hustle. Think of it as your job. Get there at the same time every day. Leave at the same time so your clientele will know when you're gonna be there. Um, uh, stay behind your chair. Like uh, running around all outside and hanging out with people in the in the neighborhood that ain't that ain't barbering you if you until you build your clientele stay behind your chairs anybody can walk in at any moment and you can catch a walk in so you got to be you know be diligent and then um in in comedy um you got to um it, it, it's a it's a it's a whole like formula where you got to be on social media you know you want to let people know what you're doing you want to um, stay on stage. You want to have little writing sessions with people because it, it, you get feedback. You know, you, you, we think we funny, but you want to be universally funny, right. not just to your friends or you know. And then once you, um, if you really want to like make a quicker ascension in comedy, you want to get a show because then you got real estate mm-hmm. and make your show hot. But don't put your friends on your show all the time. Right. Put bigger comics to make your show better. And then use that real estate so you can get more spots. Okay, you saying that made me think of one more question. Um, do you have material for different audiences? Um, well, it's just and if I mean, I'm like, if, if I'm if out you're of doing uptown or you're doing the downtown. If your majority of your audience audience is African American, Latinos, or your audience is majority. Uh, majority uh, Caucasian. Is it the same material, or do you have different material? I think it's the same material same for material. me. For me, though, right? Because I'm from Portland, right? You understand? You're very so comfortable as soon as I say, there. like, I'm from Portland, the black crowd is like, "What? A nigga from Portland?" <laughs> right. So let me hear what his angle is. As soon as I say I'm a black dude from Portland, the white crowd is like, "Oh my God, a unicorn!" <laughs> Word up. <laughs> And that, and then now they 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 listen intently like uh-huh. this guy's different like he's right. you know and they listen to my voice and stuff and they like cause when I get into my fifth joke right I got the crowd in the palm of my hand and it's not when they laughing it's when I'm telling the joke and I can hear nothing but my voice in silence and I know that I got them I'm looking at their faces right. they like this like what is this nigga gonna say next and then. That's when I know, like, I got these fools, and that's when I'm finna hit them with the titty milk joke. <laughs> all right, all right, Dub. Uh, tell people where they can find you, your social media, your show. Give them all that information. All right, so um, on Instagram, you can find me at underscore the average black man. Um, Facebook is Kenny Warren. 
Twitter is average underscore black underscore man. And you can catch me regularly at the Grizzly Pair. Um, I mean, I'm Monday night, uh, we got this new uh, uh, midnight show where strongest sets get a uh, get a, a set down in Atlantic City, and then the strongest set down there get a headliner weekend. So what we just trying to do is promote the comedians, you know what I'm saying, and create exposure and opportunities for them. But then I got a uh, Sunday night at eight, Sunday at midnight. Sometimes that's a pop up show. Saturday at eight p.m., Friday at ten p.m. and midnight. And uh, Wednesday at 8 and 10 p.m. So when people see me and be like, when you got a show, nigga, every day. (laughs) Okay, lastly, lastly, why the name The Average Black Man? Because when I grew up, my mom always told me, you got to be double as good as the white counterparts or they're going to cheat you in work or in sports. And she was right. So... I feel like as a the average black man in this world is above average, especially if you're making it. Right. The average black man is above average. You you above average. You're making it. You look good, man. You're taking care of yourself. You right. polo down. Like you doing good. You right. you you creating opportunities for others. That's why your blessings is coming exponentially. Mm-hmm. You've 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 put a lot of people on. You put me on. Mm-hmm. Like all of my stuff that I've gotten is an extension of some connection that you did like mm-hmm. think about that so i'm 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 grateful for meeting you you know same and here, um same here. yeah man and it's beautiful to just 15 years man 15 years Fly man. By. 15 years just like that man it, it's a, but it, it wasn't for nothing it could have went the other way you right. know but it's right now it's, it's it's good man y'all gotta come down to the club man check it out man i'm proud of it man you know y'all already know you can you know the barbershop is Good over there. Oh, tell them where you at. Which, oh, which shop? I'm at the shop on 124th in Lexington. Um, the most spiciest level shop by far. Uh, we got all the veterans that was there when I came to New York in 2004. Troy, Justin, Ed. It's a uh, man. It's beautiful in there, and um, y'all come through and get um, get taken care of. All right, all right. There you have it. Kenny Warren, K Dub, aka the Average Black Man. In closing, love is love, life is life, loyalty is priceless. Peace. Hey, peace.